It's two in the afternoon in Sydney, Australia. It's 12 noon in Hong Kong. In Bangkok, it's 11 in the morning. And in New Delhi, India, it's 9.30 in the morning. And that means it's time for the Asia Broadcast Technical Webinar. Hi, I'm your host, Chuck Kelly, and I'm delighted to be with you today. Although I must confess, it's a little bit of a sad occasion. I mean, today's the day we all would have started Broadcast Asia in Singapore, and I'm going to miss the chili crab and all my friends. And uh, uh, it's just not the same as it is uh, any other time. But we're going to try to make one thing the same, and that is the great technical seminars they typically have at Broadcast Asia. We've got a list of, of excellent presentations and incredible speakers that I, I think you're all going to enjoy. First, we're going to talk about some developments in state-of-the-art FM transmission from our friends at Elenos. Mr. Wayne Piscina, the president of the Society of Broadcast Engineers, is here to join us and help us get to know the Society of Broadcast Engineers. Phil Owens, sales engineer of Wheatstone, is going to talk to us about IP audio trends for television and walk us around his his home studio. Um, the DRM Consortium is here with three folks from Germany and England to talk to us about uh, the Digital Radio Mondial. And then Robert Ferguson is going to share a presentation on social distancing your studio from Wheatstone. And finally, I'll bring up the rear with a, another presentation about television tra transmission technology in a changing world. Um, all those things having been said, a couple of uh, housekeeping things. This is a long webinar. It's four and a half hours, um, approximately. And, and so need to tell you where the restrooms are, where they are, where you normally would go because you're in your house or your office. So go and, and, the, and the snack bar is there. If you need to step away, don't worry about it because we are recording this entire webinar uh, and all the segments, and it's going to be available to you at any time on demand for you to listen to or watch or share with your friends. So um, I want to tell you that you can type questions at any time right in the GoToWebinar interface up at the uh, right-hand side of your screen, I, I, I assume. And uh, in that, you have the opportunity to type in questions. And at the end of each presentation, we will do our best to answer those questions. I also need to let you know that this watching this webinar qualifies for half a credit towards SBE recertification under Category 1. So thanks to the Society of Broadcast Engineers for allowing us to pass that on to you. So with no further ado, I am going to try to get to my other presentation and uh, change what I'm seeing here and very quickly switch to this and allow you to see this presentation. And that's it. Okay. So, what we're going to do is talk about things that have changed in FM transmission of late things you may not be aware of, things that have been going on as FM transmission continues to advance and to evolve. Um, we're going to talk about RF amplifier design innovations. We're going to talk about innovations in efficiency, power supply innovation. You wouldn't think that power supplies could be that innovative, but they can be. We're going to talk about direct-to-channel FM digital exciter innovation, robustness innovation, how to keep things on the air, more and more and more and, and have less and less failures. Remote control innovation. We talk about the future that is digital and we're going to take your questions. So without any further ado, let's talk about the Indium series. This is a an LNO series transmitter, um, uh, FM transmitter, and it has, we use strip line and micro strip design techniques may not have thought about what that's good for, but it, it provides a clean design for easy troubleshooting and service, provides repeatability and precision in manufacturing because there's nothing varying around. I remember FM transmitters when they had gimmick capacitors and things you twisted together in order to make them work right. Nothing like that anymore. It's very precision It's because of these strip line and micro strip design techniques. Stable performance, reduced in-cabinet RFI, nothing to tune, you know, everything is broadbanded, the entire FM band, and it provides for the absolute maximum inefficiency. 
Well, it's also precision thermal modeling. Um, I was, you know, back when I started working with FM transmitters, people um, would run the transmitter for a few minutes and they'd go in there and reach around and figure out what was hot and if it was too hot or if it blew up, then they had to change the design around. Now it's all done with computers ahead of time, precision thermal modeling, figuring out where the heat sources are, figuring out how well the heat sinks are going to spread that heat, how well the cooling is going to be uh, cooling these things down, how close the the actual semiconductor dies and the other components are going to be to their maximum ratings. And so if we can keep those cooler, I don't know if you're aware, but there is something called metal migration in solid state devices that each 10 degrees Celsius, you keep the solid state device on the semiconductor die approximately to double the life of that solid state device. So cooling is a very, very important feature in a transmitter and the ideal component cooling with a minimum heat sink size and weight, optimizing fan speeds under all conditions for queen, uh, quiet, clean operation, provides the op ability to stay on the air under real world conditions. We've all seen products that have been designed in a laboratory in a clean room, apparently. And, and, and when you get them out into a real transmitter site with the uh, dirt, and the dust and the bugs and the rats and rodents and everything else, it, they have problems. And, and uh, these transmitters are designed to work under real world conditions. Longer PA device life due to reduced metal migration, as I mentioned. Class F PA design improves the efficiency and reliability. We're going to talk about Class F a little bit more in a future slide. We use the latest LDMOS devices for maximum efficiency. We reduce the footprint of the amplifier, making it smaller, and it reduces the heat to be dissipated, which keeps the devices cool, resulting in long life. Precision design and carefully milled combiners. Again, the, the emphasis on precision. It provides repeatable performance, protection against physical or electronic shocks, reduce losses for improved efficiency, reductions of energy costs. So efficiency is so much of an important thing these days. The Indium family includes a unique power level scheduler, which allows the automatic reduction of power at specific hours and days. So it makes logical sense that it, in some times of the day, you may not want to be operating at full power to save electrical running costs. So the Indium has a grid built in where you can say, okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, each of the hours of the day on the other, on the other axis here. And then you could say, what power level do you want to be at each of these times of the day? And by doing that, it will calculate out how much money you're saving with these decisions. They're, again, they're your decisions. Uh, you, and, and it allows intelligent business decisions to be made. The amount of power reduction may be limited by government regulations, so you'll want to double check that first, make sure that that's completely legitimate in your, city, in your country of license. Power supply design. Now, power supplies seem to be the, the simplest thing on the face of the earth. They take AC in, they turn it into DC outputs, you want it to have it some level of regulation and reducing of hum and, and all those kind of things. But what's interesting is many manufacturers use an off-the-shelf power supply, which are designed for computer clean room environments. I mean, these 48-volt power supplies that we have were designed for big servers. They run on 48 volts, and they're sealed and not user repairable. The schematic diagrams are not typically available. So the replacement of an inexpensive component often requires the replacement of an entire unit, which may not be that bad if it's not too terribly expensive, you know, slide one out, slide the other one in. But what if you're in a country that it takes a long time for the new part to get there, the new power supply, the whole power supply to get to you? And what if you would have had the component on the shelf that it would have been taken to fix it? Uh, that can be very frustrating. So in the Indium series, the Elanos engineers have designed our own power supply specifically for real world transmitter room environments like less than perfect AC and harsh physical conditions. It's optimized for the specific physical design of the transmitter and allows the dynamic voltage control 
by the transmitter. So it can change the PA voltage and it's user serviceable. And the, and the schematics are available. So this is a, a big advantage. It may very well be that you can change a five cent fuse and get your transmitter right back on the air again without waiting for a week or two for a whole new power supply to come. So the Indium remote control um, can monitor output current, output voltage, mains voltage, input over voltage, temperatures, data communications errors, and internal failures, and each supply is addressable. I may have confused you here. This is the remote control of just the power supply. The power supply is communicating everything that's going on, which allows you to troubleshoot it remotely. So the power supply is communicating all that information back to the transmitter and back to you. In the Indium series, we have a fully digital exciter that offers truly transparent industry leading audio performance, a wide variety of auto switching inputs, balanced analog L plus R, AES EBU, analog MPX, and MPX over AES. Now, if you haven't used MPX over AES, this is something I would really recommend. It's not just Elanos that has this technology. Many other FM transmitter manufacturers these days uh, have, have used MPX over AES. Basically, it boils down to this. The ability, you have fantastic digital audio processors, such as are manufactured by our friends at Wheatstone, a presentation coming up, um, and, and they can output, these are digital audio processors, and they can output digital audio, but the transmitters that most people have have analog inputs or maybe an AES EBU input, but you can't have the maximum loudness uh, by connecting those together that way. So what we can do is we can take the MPX that has the full advantage of the uh, composite clipping and things that are being done in the audio processor, give you the maximum loudness, but bring it over digitally in uh, over AES. So you end up with a single XLR connector which is replacing that analog BNC to BNC cable unbalanced. Um, and it's a much better system. You have a better noise, a, uh, less A to D and D to A, uh, the distortions that are caused by those. And so this having MPX over AES can make probably one of the biggest differences in the audio quality in your station in the last few years. Uh, it's, a, it's quite a wonderful development. Uh, it has the capability for single frequency networking with 10 megahertz and one PPS, one part per second uh, inputs. So you can build a single frequency network um, with this. Uh, it has a shoutcast and ice coast streaming input so you can stream audio to it uh, via IP. And it, by the way, it will allow you to auto switch among those um, so that the IceCast shoutcast could be, for instance, a backup uh, audio source, uh, just in case you have a, a, a fault in your STL. Um, the Indian series is designed for long life and robustness. Um, I mean, after all, all the fancy features and outstanding performance are worthless if the transmitter is unreliable. So how does the Elenos group assure the reliability and long life of its products? There's a lot of design headroom, assuring that every component is well within the maximum limits, both by design, extensive design modeling, and in testing for it. And adherence to tough industry standards for mean time between failure calculations. We use thermal camera measurements, so it's not just enough to, to, or to, to, to run a model, a thermal computer model of, of a system. What we do is we'll actually put a transmitter in a heat tent at the maximum design temperature, run it at full out, full specification, full power, maximum voltage, maximum VSWR, and then we will shoot a thermal camera into the transmitter, looking at the, each of the components and assuring that their temperature in under load, in worst case conditions, has a significant uh, design headroom to the maximum temperatures. Um, we use an external MTBF evaluation consultant 
and the MTBF design target is 30 to 60 years. Longer than you're probably planning on using a transmitter, but that's what gives you the reliability that you're looking for to make sure that uh, this year and next year and the year after you get a good night's sleep rather than running out to the transmitter site. Ultra high reliability must be designed in from the beginning and it requires extensive design tools and analysis. We use an external MTBF consultant and the Isograph reliability workbench software is used which provides fault-free analysis FMECA, FMEDA, and FMEA analysis, RBD analysis, failure rate prediction, Markov analysis, Weibull analysis. I'm not an expert in all these things, but it's pretty impressive. I mean, it's it, these are things that were not done just a few years ago, but they make a demonstrable difference in the reliability of the products that we use. And that's that's why you're seeing the kinds of reliability in these transmitters as uh, as you're seeing. Um, we look at the careful evaluation of thermal cycling stress, which has been known to, to be responsible for many short-term and long-term failures. As I mentioned, we use thermal imaging cameras to isolate and correct hotspots before the first units are sold. That's a, cop that's a picture of the right-hand side of a FLIR, a forward-looking infrared camera that allows you to see the various temperatures up to uh, the, the, the bright yellow is at 45.9 degrees Celsius. Then we have something called the Elenos Life Extender. Think of it as a safety net. Um, the world is a harsh place, particularly transmitter sites. Up there. We have extreme AC voltage fluctuations and surges. We have both extreme high temperatures and low temperatures. And we have high dust and dirt environments. The life extender system built into your LNOS FM transmitter monitors and controls every aspect of transmitter operation from temperature, voltages, currents, to fan speeds, reflected power. And it takes intelligent action to protect the transmitter and keep you on air. And our remote control system is more than just a pretty screen. Let's face it, nobody lives at the transmitter site anymore. So accessible, effective remote control is essential. It works through the web. There's no flash, never has been. It's all uh, much more uh, progressive web technology. Supports advanced SNMP. You can communicate with some models through SMS with an optional 3G, 4G modem built into the transmitter. Can display hundreds of parameters, log unlimited numbers of events, and send alerts. You can see it on your phone, you can see it on your iPad, you can see it uh, on your computer. Now, the, we believe at the LNOS Group that the future is digital. AM and FM analog broadcasting has been around for many, many years and it's served us well. And we believe those bands are very important for broadcasting going forward for radio but we believe that the future is digital and in-band digital solutions uh, we think is the right way to go. It allows us to remain competitive uh, with all the different sources of, of, of content that people can consume. Think about it. When, when I got into this business so back in the early 70s, all the ears belonged to radio. You know, people... You know, there was there were when you're driving in your car, you're listening to the radio, or you're talking to somebody, or you're singing. But you're there's nothing else you can be doing uh, at at that time. And then as time went by, people got cassette machines in their cars, and 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 then eventually CD players and MP3 players, and then there's webcasting and satellite broadcasting and everything else. There are so many content channels. Back when I got started in radio. When I fell in love with radio, there was, you know, there were a very few number of stations and all the different formats happened at different day parts. If I wanted to listen to jazz music, I knew it was on Sunday night on this station. But today, because of the multiplicity of formats, people can want to hear what they want to hear when they want to hear it, which requires a lot more content channels. And radio just doesn't have that many content channels. So digital radio makes it possible for us to compete 
with all those content channels. We are developing in Elenos digital high efficiency FM transmitters and the Pro Television RF supercomputer is the most advanced digital exciter in the world and we'll talk about that in a second. First of all, I want to talk about the high efficiency. I mentioned that the Elenos amplifiers run class F. In class, we've heard of class A and class B and class AB and class C. Typically, FM stations have run class C. You can see class C is right here. It operates under a 90% of the total, or 90 degrees, I should say, of the total 360 degrees in terms of a conduction angle. So A would be operating under all 360 degrees, roughly. Uh, but now, when we get to class E, that's over here somewhere, and or I'm sorry, class F, and that has an even more reduced conduction angle, but it provides for an efficiency of somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 90 percent at the solid state device, um, which is better than class C, which may be in the neighborhood of 75 percent. So you can see uh, how class F amplifiers will boost both the efficiency and the output by using harmonic resonators in the output network to help shape the output waveform into a square wave. You know, it has integrated uh, ESD or, or high voltage pr uh, pulse protection, excellent ruggedness. This is the Amplion device you can see on the left, the BLF-188XR. High efficiency, excellent thermal stability, and it's designed for broadband operation from HF to 600 megahertz. So that's class F up operation. One of the things that makes our solution yeah, um, very unique is that the Elenos amplifier, the Elenos transmitters based on the, the new uh, uh, Pro Television RF supercomputer had advanced adaptive pre-correction. And adaptive pre-correction is very important when we're running digital operation. What we do is we bring back, as you can see here, samples, these are the, the P, this is the PA here, this is the modulator over here. We bring back samples, both of the nonlinear and the linear samples. Nonlinear is looking for basically distortion. Nonlinear distortion caused by the PA not operating in its completely linear uh, area of operation. And it then pre-corrects for that in the exciter. And it allows us to run that amplifier more efficiently by reducing the amount of nonlinearities or distortions. In addition, there are nonlinearities that occur in the phase and amplitude domain uh, that are caused by bandpass filters near the output of the transmitter or perhaps in your combiner. And this linear uh, adaptive pre-correction comes back and it corrects for those as well. So you could get better performance, interestingly, both in terms of digital broadcasting, where you're looking basically at an MER, but also in terms of analog broadcasting, analog FM. You can improve your audio performance in analog FM. Another thing that's unique about this RF supercomputer is that we are developing to, to a, a, an interface, and it's not yet done, but we're working on it, which will follow the ATSC3, what's called the A-324 STL protocol. So it turns out that, and, and you might ask, why is he talking about ATSC television or ATSC3 television? It's because the guys at the Advanced Television System Committee, folks there, developed an interface, a protocol, for the studio to transmitter link, which is a digital protocol, and they developed it for ATSC. It's very configurable, so you could add in as many audio or video streams or telemetry uh, data streams that go back and forth between the studio and the transmitter. So since we're doing radio, we don't necessarily have to send up video. We can just send up as many audio streams as we want. If we have multiple audio streams for our digital broadcasts, we can send multiple audio streams. So it in includes provisions for precise timing, which makes possible SFN applications for 
um, single frequency networks and to minimize the dynamic changes in the analog and digital timing. This is one of the things that I like a lot. It has end-to-end -end IP security provisions to minimize the chance of having an STL hacked. I think we all are probably aware now that we're moving our STLs onto the public internet, um, that, that, that leaves us vulnerable in some situations to hackers coming in and hijacking our signals. And uh, this protocol provides an end-to-end -end IP security. Nothing is 100%, but it's a whole lot better than nothing. It also allows for redundancy in the content. And as it's already being implemented in our ATSC of your modulator, it's being implemented in our digital radio modulators as well. So this is that RF supercomputer I was talking about. This is a exciter that is going to be the future of our exciters for FM. Um, it is a basically an RF supercomputer. It's a very, very powerful processor uh, with programmable DSP, a large programmable FPGA. Uh, it, it has a couple of Linux processors in there. The coolest thing about it is that it's completely configurable to be what you want it to be. It's developed as a digital television exciter. So it supports, depending on the program that you run on it, in other words, the, the programming that you give it, telling it what it's supposed to do, it supports DVB-T, DVB-TH, T2, ATSC Legacy, ATSC3, ISDBT or TBB, the Brazilian alternative, Analog PAL TV, NTSC, DAB, TDMB, DAB plus HD radio, and DRM. So it basically, it operates from 30 megahertz to 760 megahertz in one hertz steps. It has built-in GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and Beidou, um, so it can keep itself synchronized. Everything works to that synchronized clock. It, it has, it consists of, and this blows my mind, it consists of a 16-layer printed circuit board with over 2,200 parts. And all you got to do to change it from being a television modulator to being a DRM modulator is flip a switch, change, upload the program into it, tell it what to be, and that's what it's going to be. So these are, this is the basis of our trans, RF trans, or FM transmitters going forward. Um, let me see if there's any questions. I don't believe so um, on my part, but if you do have them, just type them in later and I will get to them via IP. I wanna thank you for your time on this presentation. We know how valuable your time is and we're honored you chose to spend some time with us. Check out, check out our upcoming webinar schedule at www.elanosgroup.com forward slash webinar. And for further information, please contact my good friend, Mr. Frank Massa, Asia Pacific Group Sales Manager located in Bangkok, Thailand. And his email address is f.massa at elanos.com.